If you're a 28 handicapper with one arm, or you're a 28 handicapper with two arms, you're still a 28 handicapper. It's the same level. I was striking it well, hitting the fairways. I was losing like 20 yards of club. Brendan, if you'd like to step forward and collect your trophy. Yeah, I never talked about that before. Right. So it never, never annoyed me. It, it generated a lot of negative hate, like, like feedback and, and comments. And I've, obviously I've dealt with this my whole life. It's never annoyed me. And my brother rang me. He's like, you see these, see these comments? He's like, yeah. I was like, that happened all the time. He said, that's annoying me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know, but it doesn't annoy me, so it shouldn't annoy you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whose idea was it, Brendan, to start in this hole? That's what I want to know. Yours, which isn't <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> This is the <coughs> tightest par three I've ever seen in my life. The last day of G40 Open, this place is 206. 206. From back there with the pin at the back. What did you hit? I hit like a rescue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a bottleneck, because them trees come in. You have to fly at 190 to get over the trees as well. So it's a tough hole. Okay, it looks like about 166 today. What have you got? I'm going to chip a wee five iron today. Love it. It is so great to see you here at the scene of your victory last year, the G4D <laughs> Open. Good memories must be coming flooding back. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I was very lucky to get a year's membership here after winning that event, which, which is incredible. What a lovely place. And I haven't took advantage of it, but coming over here, getting a few days practicing, it it's feels special to be back. Yeah, yeah we'll come back to that in a minute and, and more about the G4D Open this year, because obviously the event is coming back and we want to hear all about it. But as you know, this, this series that we've been running, uh, we're very lucky and very honoured to get the time with people like yourself who are such an inspiration for so many reasons, not just on the golf course, but off the golf course too. And it's really an opportunity for us and everyone who's enjoying this to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Brendan Lawler, we know as a prolific winner on the G4D Tour, but I want to go right back to the beginning of your story and, and your journey, because it is a particularly inspiring one. Yeah. And it's been full of adversity and the life you're living now is is so exciting yeah. and it must be wonderful, but I know it hasn't been a straightforward journey to get there. So let's go back to, to wee laddie Brendan yeah, yeah. and tell us a little bit about what you remember about coming into the world. Yeah, it's quite crazy. Every, every Since this journey started, more and more, I delved into my past and realised how tough it was at the start. Because I lived my life extremely normal. I played a lot of sport. I hung around with my brother and his friends quite a lot. And they kind of, they made me feel normal. But talking to mum and dad, the intrusive operations when I was born, I was born with a condition called Ellis Van Crevel, which is a shorter limbs and shorter stature. So at the very start, it was touch and go whether I was going to make it. I was born with a hole in my heart as well. So I got a VSD repair done at six weeks old. And no child's meant to get that operation until their year because it's just, it's so bad to cut you open. I have a scar from here down to, down to my belly button. So it was a tough start. So that got that operation done. I was meant to be in the hospital for a year and a half and I was out in six months. So I was a fighter from the start. Wow. And it's incredible. That I don't like the way doctors do it. They told my mum and dad everything they wouldn't be able to do. I wouldn't be able to drink a bottle, I wouldn't be able to eat, I had to be tube fed, all this stuff. So I went to my granny's one day and, and I, I used to be fed through uh, a, like a syringe, went up my nose. And I, I was that angry, I pulled it out one day and she was like, what am I gonna do? So she fed me a bottle, she put a bottle down my throat and fed me a bottle. So that's how, I couldn't do the sucking motion, but I had it there. So my auntie was like, if you can do that, you can really do anything because I don't really believe doctors saying he can't do this, he can't do that. So going later on in life when I was five and six, I felt I was an incredibly confident young guy. I played a lot of Gaelic football, played a lot of soccer, tennis, done everything any, any young kid would do. And then there was, there was hard times. There was, um, I was born with a condition called knock knee, which my feet were like a penguin, out like this. And I had to get plates on my knees to sort of bring them back straight. So that was a regular occurrence. I got that done when I was five years old, but I had to get it done when I was eight, 15, when I was growing. And then when I was fully growing at say 14 or 15, I didn't have to get that done anymore. So when I was in sixth class, 11 years old, I had two operations that year on my knees and, and I missed a lot of school. 
but I was very lucky my, my mum and dad weren't driven on results in school they were driven on happiness that I could go into school have a good day not get bullied I can come home play pitch and push which is what I love to do me and mum used to go there after school play a round or two at four or five o'clock and then come home so they were consistently driven on making my life as happy and easy as possible which was a great approach because that took a lot of pressure off me trying to perform on an academic site. I wasn't good at school, <laughs> I wasn't good at academics but there was no pressure on me so I tried my hardest and they said well if you try your hardest and all else fails we don't care and mum always said well, what's for you won't pass you. So then going on to when I was 16 or sorry 13 and 14 this was going into the big bad world of uh, secondary school where yes I was smaller in primary but I made my friends right up until six year because I wasn't different until four class when everyone started out growing me. So I said, I didn't see it as a challenge. I just saw it as I'm going into the supermarket here. People are going to look at me anyway. I didn't care. I always got that. I always got it. So when in when in the secondary school, the big assembly and people are looking and pointing and all that, just made a joke. No, I don't even think it was about myself. I think it was just a normal joke, and everyone everyone sort of gravitated towards my humour and energy. So I made friends extremely quick. Right. I said, this is going to be a hard six years yeah. or I'm going to breeze through this. Because friends is big, it helps you through everything at that stage in life. Because yeah. if you had to do all them challenges on your own, you start struggling with mental health issues. I had a lot of excuses to struggle with my mental health, but I never did, Great. which I've been very lucky. And uh, then the golf came in. Yeah. I started golf when I was 16. Uh, I was extremely confident. I played a lot of sport and I was good at sport. I got to, um, I won all islands in pitch and putt, which is a part three golf, and reached the pinnacle of that. And I said, I can't do anything more. I can't win anything as big as I won. I'm going to move on to golf. And then the journey from hitting that first ball to getting addicted to trying and getting better and better and better, going to the range every day, going to RD Golf Club every day. It was like a therapy. It was like you're walking out in the fresh air. Your friends are playing as well. Just incredible. Mm. Unreal. Amazing. Right, a cheeky little 52. Got a lucky kick out the trees there. Get in. Yeah, that's really nice. Thanks. Well done. Well out. Sit. Beautifully played. Off the down slope. What kind, of, what kind of golf do you like to play? Being from Ireland, are you a Lynx guy or do you like this kind of golf? Love Lynx. Really love Lynx. We have an event next week in Ireland in Sligo. Oh yeah. Golf Ireland have embraced what, what disability golf unbelievable the last couple of years. Yeah. And um, they're having the best 10 players play at the west of Ireland. Cool. In between the final and the semi-final. So that's really good. It just shows more Irish people what we do and stuff, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Yeah. So I'm playing that Monday and Tuesday, next Monday and Tuesday, so it should be really good. Epic. Missed a half. <laughs> Go on. Beautiful. Lovely. Great up and down. <laughs> Lovely. Love that. Obviously, we get to see each other out on the tour now. I mean, yeah. you've become such a, a face synonymous with golf, but you've been through so much and there will be young people watching this who perhaps have their own disability. Yeah. And they might share that with you or it might be something different. And I just want to, I want to focus on, on what message you would have for them mm. if they're going through, school is hard. Yeah. You know, no matter who you are, school is just a hard chapter in your life where you're learning big lessons. Yeah. And actually I look back and I just see it as a big series of mistakes. And I was lucky like you, I had great friends and we all kind of making these mistakes together. But there'll be young people watching and they might be really struggling yeah. with feeling feeling like they're different and yeah. that their, their future is limited. Mm. And I wonder what message you have for them. Well, I think it's seriously important to follow your own path in life. Like, I was never influenced on what my friends did, whether they were going to college or whether they were going to drink in the pub on a Saturday. I always followed my own. I, I was the leader of myself. I wasn't a sheep. I wasn't following anyone. And I think kids nowadays can definitely get sucked into, right, my friend's going to study business in DCU. I'm going to do that, mm -hmm. which I think is the complete wrong option. I think it's important that you follow your own thing because realistically the friends you make in secondary school you're not going to talk to them after that 
even if you go to the same college, you're going to make your own friends groups again. I don't talk to anyone in secondary school. I have no, I made a lot of friends in secondary school. Don't talk to one of them now, because everyone goes on their own journey. Yeah. And I think people can fall into following other people's journeys. And I think it's more it's important to focus on your own one. When did you get your first set of golf clubs? First set of golf clubs. I didn't start golf playing sixteen, so it's very late yeah. joining. But I played pitch and putt, which is an old par trees in Ireland. And my grand had cut me down a driver when I was three years old. And my first hold one with driver from like 60 yards. So oh. first set of golf clubs, I was probably around 16. And what have you got in the bag? Can you talk us through a bit yeah. of what's in here? So people look at me, right, I'm a wee bit shorter. This is club shorter, and they're not. Driver standard length. Yeah. Wood standard length. Uh, iron standard length. The only thing shorter is my wedges and my putter right. for a wee bit of control. So my wedges are two inches shorter yep. and my putter is only 31 inches. It's really short. That's amazing. Yeah. So how does that work? Because you know, often women, as a generalisation, who are maybe a little bit shorter, get shorter clubs. So yeah. how talk us through how that, how that, why you find that to be the best setup for you. I tried the shorter clubs and I was losing a lot of distance. Yeah. So I created quite a, I create quite a big arc when I swing. And the shorter club just wasn't doing it for me. I was striking it well, hitting fairways, but I was losing like 20 yards of club. Yeah. Because I cut them down about two, three inches. It felt comfortable, but it just was going nowhere. Yeah. So then I just built it up, started using standard length clubs, and I noticed just going to the gym, doing my own stuff, I was starting to gain a wee bit of length. So I just stuck with it. Amazing. Felt comfortable. Yeah. Really comfortable. So now does it just feel totally normal? Just normal, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. We have the perfect setup now, which is great. Love it. You mentioned that you had. You, plenty of, of reasons perhaps to struggle with your mental health yeah. and and I think as a young person now it's I mean I was lucky to grow up in an age where there wasn't really much social media yeah. and you you said that you had plenty of reasons excuses whatever you want to call yeah. it to perhaps struggle with your mental health people pointing at you in the supermarket yeah. but you've you haven't struggled and you've you're such a, you're an infectious mm. energy to be around. Yeah. And like you say, you've got such a great aura about you and energy that people just gravitate towards that. But I'm wondering what you think is the secret to how you've managed through through everything you've been through to, to have a, such a happy and positive outlook on life. I think it's, it's definitely surrounding yourself with the right people. I'm extremely far, family oriented. Um, my two best friends, my cousins, one plays golf and one is like my social social life <laughs> so uh, Connor and Finton Finton's a professional golfer I always say Finton's between 9 and 3 o'clock and then Connor's between 6 and whenever we get home <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah I think surround yourself with the right people and when you say about the mental health thing it's never it's not always been easy because I never struggled with my mental health the transition between turn and pro I struggled with I never talked about this before I turned pro in 2019 uh, 2019 First year was amazing, I won three events. Second year it felt I had such a pressure on my shoulders to perform for, manage, for my management team, for myself, my family, and I got into this really dark place. And I didn't know why, because I was always a jolly kind of guy. I was always really comfortable in myself. And I struggled for a year, and that whole year, I never thought about, I'm smaller, this is why I'm struggling. That wasn't my struggle. My struggle was, my life's perfect, why am I not happy? And I never, went back to I'm different I never went back to yes you're slightly different but it never never crossed my mind that's why I'm struggling with my mental health it was like there was a weight on my shoulders to perform and it made me so angry that I was struggling because I'm such a happy person I was like I am so happy sorry it's sorry, fine, swear, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> I'm so uh, happy <laughs> this shouldn't be my life so I went to see someone I'd never do that and I just pointed out all the good things that were happening in my life. I, yeah. I had a wonderful girlfriend. I was doing what I loved to do. And it just went. I was so lucky. Mm -hmm. I just went back to my childhood of, I put myself back in that supermarket where the worst case scenario didn't affect me. So why should this little thing affect me? You know what I mean? But everything's been smooth sailing. As I said, I struggled about for a year. I think everyone does in their life at some stage. Yeah. And then everything's been smooth sailing. Yeah. I guess there's a lesson in there about the importance of of reaching out for help when yeah. when you need it. And that's the thing, when, when, when I was going through the hard time, I talked to my family about everything. Yeah. That one day where I felt really bad, I'd go to my mum's and have a cup of tea and say, I'm feeling a bit today, mum. 
Yeah. And she would talk me through that. And then I'd go in to Dad's office and we'd have a chat and stuff. But yeah. I think talking's the most important thing about everything. Yeah. 100%. Should we get you a jumper? You're shivering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty chilly out here at Woolworth. <laughs> yeah, I never talked about that before. Right. So it never, never annoyed me. I think it's also really interesting, isn't it? How it's, it's so often in life, adversity and, and when you face a struggle, it can, it can make you be really driven and you feel something kick in inside of you that goes, I'm going for this and you get focused and determined. And then suddenly when you reach that goal, yeah. I've heard elite athletes like yourself speak about how they feel a bit empty inside. Yeah, it was like, I think the hardest challenge of my life was trying to get my mental health back to where it was. Never mind being smaller, never mind people laughing at you. That never annoyed me. Because maybe it was something I was comfortable with. It happened very early and I was comfortable with it. But what annoyed me was I was such a happy guy and I wasn't happy. And everything around me was perfect. That's so interesting. It's, it's so weird. Yeah. And then getting the golf kind of, whether I was performing or not, in my worst mental health year I won three events because golf didn't matter to me. I just went out and didn't care. Mm -hmm. Then when I got my health back, I was going out to play golf and I wasn't winning. But I didn't care because I was happy. You know what I mean? Mm. I was winning so easy when, because every shot didn't matter. When I hit a bad shot, I was in that mental space of the same. And then I got back onto the course and I had a conversation with dad about this. He's like, oh, you had a bad day, are you, are you feeling well? I said, I'm feeling unreal. And I take that a hundred times over than playing good golf. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care about playing good golf once I'm happy. Because there's more to life than this. Yeah. If I, if I give this up in the morning, I love doing what I do. But if I was struggling mentally, and it was affecting my golf, I wouldn't play it. Mm -hmm. And if I was happy not playing golf, I would, I'd do that. Mm -hmm. It's just all about being happy in life mm -hmm. and finding that path. Okay, lead us off here. Beautiful hole. Tough Park hole. Four. Another tight one. Mm -hmm. Probably advise you to stay down the right side okay. because the trees come in from the left and block that pin. So. Okay. About <laughs> 10 yards good. right of that pin is a good line. All right. Textbook. That's good there. I mean, to be honest, Brendan, that's about nine yards right of it. <laughs> that's not good enough. <laughs> Any sign? Sit. Did you see it down? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah? Yeah. Couldn't see it in that light. Yeah, no, it's good there. It's so important to hit fairways here. Yeah. Last okay. year, I was probably last in putting stats. My putting for the week was horrendous, but I hit like 50 greens out of 54 greens, hit it really good, hit every fairway. And that can win you around here, just hitting fairways. Yeah. It's so tough. So how many rounds was the G4D open? It was three round event. Right. So I shot it's three under, off. three under first round. Um, I was three over second round and two over the last round, so I was plus two for the tournament. It was tough conditions though, wasn't it? Extremely. Yeah. A lot of rain, very wet. Um, but it was such a good event, probably the best run event we've ever played. And there was so many diverse with disabilities, there was 80 players. Yep. Give everyone a chance in their own category. And it was just an incredible event. Yeah. Everyone was so happy. Weather put a wee bit of a dampener on it because it was so wet. But all in all, it was fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how it works with the, the variety of disabilities? Yeah. And how that, that, how that all comes into play? Yeah, so on the G4D, basically it's, it's all gross. So if you have one arm and you play off scratch, if you have one leg or you're shorter in stature, you're all on the level playing field. Right. When it comes into like the G4D Open, you have your net, staple for the gross category and wheelchair category. Okay. So there's three different categories where people can aspire to whatever category to feel they can fit in, which is great. Yeah. Gives everyone a chance. That's amazing. Yeah. How, how much do you think golf and the ability for people with disabilities to play changes lives? 100%. I think even playing, like what I did as, as a young guy at 16, going out and playing on a Sunday, yeah. that changes your life. Never mind getting opportunities on the DP World and the PGA Tour. Yeah. That's like, you're at, you're at home watching Rory McIlroy and you're dreaming of that. Yeah. It's a dream. And people say to me, would you not try a Challenge Tour? Would you not make cuts in DP World Tour? But that's not my fit. My fit's to make an impact on disability players and what I do is, is different. Yeah. So if I suddenly throw myself in and miss cuts in Challenge Tour, you degrade your value a wee bit. Totally, yeah. And you're not helping people either. Uh -huh. So what I do is, 
I feel I can help a certain amount of people if, if I do make a cutting challenge tour. If I, it, it's not that I'm not capable of doing what I am, but yeah, yeah. it's a different level. Yeah. 100%. What's been the, the standout moment for you so far in your career? On the golf course? Yeah. I've won, I've won, a, I won a lot of events, which was great. But a standout prolific moment. Prolific winner. You were a prolific winner. Yeah, I won a few <laughs> events. But, but the, the main thing I thought was mental. I hit a shot in the first Australian All Abilities in 2019. Last hole was a par three. I hit two iron to be four feet. And everyone was going down the fairway shouting Lola. Wow. Like about three, four thousand people. And that was like mental. Uh, and every time you go back to Australia, they take, they love disability golf. Yeah. We played last year in uh, the Australian club. And Adam Scott was teeing off on 10. And Juan Postigo was teeing off on 1. And there was more people watching Juan Postigo than Adam Scott. It was mental. Oh my gosh. So we have such a big impact in Australia. So if we can get all the other countries to adapt the way they do, we're yeah. going to be in a really good place. Love that, it's yeah. great. Okay, I'm down the left. You've piped one past me. <laughs> 108. Oh, that looks good. Very nice. Thanks. That is a gorgeous drive. Yeah, we'll take that one. What's your, what's your biggest strength, would you say, in your game? I think I'm very strong off the tee. I hit a lot of fairways. Like my miss isn't bad. So my miss would just be say, just off the fairway. But my wedge game's pretty good as well. I'm struggling with my irons at the minute. Right. Irons is probably a struggle. Putting's probably a struggle as well. But wedges and drivers probably my forte. Cool. I'll probably shank this now or something. <laughs> Beauty. Right, down it. Great shot. That, cheers. That was a very nice shot there, Brendan. Thank you. Well done. You too. Do you get to spend much time with the likes of McElroy and you mentioned Shane? Thanks. Yeah, I'm very lucky that um, any event we go to, I'd always have a few chats at Rory. Me and Shane are coached by the same coach, Neil Mancha. Okay. So we spend a good bit of time together. Yep. But I love how the Irish really embrace what we do. They're really sort of considered as their own and all that sort of stuff. That's epic. But it's the same, it's it's like a roll-on effect in Spain. Like Juan Pastigo's good friends with all the Spanish guys. We went out for dinner in uh, Kenya with Nacho Elvira, yeah. all them guys and stuff. So it's nice that they kind of admire what we do. Yeah. Drop. Oh. That's good. Give that a go, thank you. Hit that away. Brilliant. Lovely. So classy. Ah. Golf's an easy game. We'll take that one. <laughs> how important is it for you to share your platform and how aware are you of just, just that, how important that platform is now? Yeah, it's incredible. The, the last few years has been mind blowing. Yeah. The amount of people we got into the game. What, what I find most extraordinary is when I was born with this condition, mum and dad didn't have a role model that they could ask what his life would be. And Going on to my Instagram, there's been about seven or eight people with Ellis Van Crevel from America, Australia. Their parents asking me, well, what was your journey? I said, well, I was born with six fingers. Oh my God, so was the same Matthew. He is not me, so did I. So they're going through the same journey and if they can see I've turned out half all right, <laughs> they, 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 can, um, they can be very hopeful for their son or daughter that has a condition like me, mm. big time. Who was your biggest role model growing up? It would have to be, family-wise, my granddad. He's the one that introduced me into golf. He's still alive, he's super passionate about what I do. Commenting on Instagram every second day, <laughs> God knows what. <laughs> but um, it would have to be Porrick Harrington as well. I, um, I look up to everyone, but I definitely look up to Porrick Harrington. Yeah. He's, uh, he's incredible. He's, um, I'm very lucky that I met him about a year and a half ago. He shared his number with me and uh, when he does well, I give him a text. When I do well, he gives me a text and we have food together. Like that's, it's crazy me saying stuff like that. Even with Rory McIlroy, spent a lot of time with Rory, spent a lot of time with Shane Lowry. It's uh, looking at these guys on TV, 
they're like superheroes and now you're you're in a position to call them friends it's pretty incredible mm. yeah and of course as part of your management team you've got nal horan in there yeah. he's a pretty big fish <laughs> big 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 dog yeah, yeah. How, how how's the experience being signed by a management company like you say it's been an amazing few years yeah. but you're a professional golfer now brilliant support in the modest management team how's that experience been yeah going back to sort of when we were going to sign it was um it, it was weird I, I i won a few events and when someone approaches you of his staff you're like right i'm going i'm going straight away but me and dad had a lot of conversations about that and I met up with Mark in a cafe in Belfast for the first time. He's like, we're interested in signing you. And as a young 19 or 20 year old, like, yeah, Niall Horan, I'm, well, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> so I went back and had the chat to dad and he was like, you have to see if there's an offer on the table first. You can't just put pen to paper and nothing to be there. So I rang Mark back and I said, can you guarantee me any brands that want to work with me or sign me? He said, leave it with me. Round me back in two days. Adidas and TaylorMade want to sign you. So I, <laughs> where, where do I sign? <laughs> where do I sign? Um, but as ironic as it is, it's hard to put your life in the hands of a singer. But when you see that work Niall has done from when he started to where they are now, to where they are at now with Tyrrell Hatton, Leon McGuire, mm -hmm. Connor Syme, Ewan, they've done some incredible work. And they're called Modest Golf, and that's exactly what they are. Niall's probably the most modest superstar I've ever, I've ever seen. Does so much to help people and he's definitely changed my life. And of course, you, you, you do speak so well about the game. We've had the pleasure of your company in the commentary box sometimes when we've been, been on tour and you've, you're done for the week and you come and, you come and keep us company in there. Yeah. That pl platform's so important, but with, with every platform there can be downsides as well and there can be sharp edges and I know that it hasn't all been plain sailing yeah. and there was actually a specific moment was it last year last year yeah yeah that, that where you really decided to take a stand and it, and it made quite an impression actually yeah big time it was um I got a DP world tour start in Japan and I hit a shot and I hit the pin it was a pretty good shot and DP world put it up on their social media and it it generated a lot of negative hate like like feedback and, and comments and I've, obviously I've dealt with this my whole life. It's never annoyed me. And my brother rang me. He's like, you see these, see these comments? He's like, yeah. I was like, they happen all the time. He says, this is annoying me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know, but it doesn't annoy me, so it shouldn't annoy you. And he said, would you ever think of doing something? Ring Mark from Modest and highlight it. He said, it's happened quite a bit. Would you think it's a good message to highlight? Mm. He said, yeah, I'll run the idea by him. So Mark said, that's actually a really good idea. As this, he said, it's not a publicity stunt. It's not looking to get more followers. It's about raising awareness for what you do. So we put up an image, it was like, short, I bet he is short games really good, or pant size 34, 12. All this were like really, really oh, negative oh. comments. So we uh, put him in a little picture and I spoke after it. <clears throat> spoke about what we're doing like what small narrow minded people are thinking of someone trying to create a difference in the world, all that sort of stuff. So it really hit home, like Niall got involved, Shane Larry got involved, Rory got involved, Justin Thomas texted me. Some of the world leaders of golf got involved and it hit home because when I look at stuff, DP World put up, put up videos now, like say a Wan Pastigo on one leg, all that hate's gone. There's no people saying small golf or one-legged player, whatever that is. And that's the message we, we wanted to represent. Mm. Like these guys can easily struggle with mental health with, with the differences they had in their life. So it's just one more excuse not for them to mm. feel like crap after around the golf or people saying negative things, and like a coping mechanism. Mm. Yeah. Well done for that, it's brilliant. Yeah. And long may that positive and the, the right attitude continue. I'm gonna ask a question here that I want it to come across in the right way, but for people that are watching, that maybe are they want to they want to play golf with everybody, yeah. and they want to say the right thing, but end up saying the wrong thing. What 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 advice you have? Like, what's what's really the wrong thing, the wrong way to approach disability golf and inclusion, and what's the right way, in your opinion? I think if someone feels it says something wrong, it's it's about the player they've said said it to. If you get me. 
people could say anything to me and it wouldn't annoy me uh -huh. because I think golf's a game for everybody uh -huh. whether you have a disability or not and definitely in Ireland golf clubs are getting far more acceptable for people with disabilities whether they have one arm but if you're if you're a 28 handicapper with one arm or you're a 28 handicapper with two arms you're still a 28 handicapper it's okay. the same level yeah so that's the message we're trying to definitely put into Ireland that yeah. these golfers are probably better than most but not different mm -hmm. so I only this is a wee dog leg left okay par five your line is probably five yards right of this tree okay straight in front oh it's perfection <laughs> so good right there that is an absolute <laughs> joke that is so that's he said, he said five yards. I'm sort of having a little snigger to myself. He's only gone and hit that five yards right at that branch. My goodness, this is a friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good shot. That tree on the right, if you're too close to that, you've no angle in. So if you're laying up, I'd lay up a wee bit further back. I made that mistake yesterday. Okay. I laid up too far and was blocked out. So what kind of number do you think I need to hit here? Uh, I'd say a 180 shot. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Straight into the trees. Ricocheted right. That was always my plan. I just planned to do exactly that. Perfect layup. Oh. Peach. So, how special was the G4D Open and that the emergence of that event? It was huge. It was the first co-sanctioned event with the RNA and Edgar, which was huge. It was just it had a different feel. All the boarding was around. All the attention was on the players. Yeah. And it was a standalone event. There was nothing going on apart from that event which is what we want, to get the message out, to get people to know what we do, we, we want people to see it. Yeah. And how well documented it was that week as well was, was mental. It was a whole, it was an hour long episode on Sky. It was just incredible. Yeah. It was all on the players, it was really, really good. And how do you enjoy that feeling of coming down the stretch, being in contention? It's a lot of pressure, I mean golf is you know, when you're competing, we all feel it, it's all relative. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's your Monday roll up or yeah. you're competing in the G4D Open, that yeah. pressure is really difficult to handle. How mm. do you manage that? Yeah, it works both ways, doesn't it? It's like you either crumble or you, or you love it. Yeah. And I love that pressure. If I have a league coming down the last or I have something to chase for, I just love that. Yeah. That's what I play for, the competitive edge. And like, it works a lot of the time. Sometimes you crumble. You're not the Terminator, it happens, but I love that sort of feeling of, I have to make this putt, or yeah. I have to hit this fair. That's what I really, really love with the game. It's great. Be good. Sit. Sit. Yeah, really good. Middle nice. of the green. What's your favorite stretch of coastline for Irish golf? Probably up by Cork and Kerry. You've Tralee, Ballybunion, Waterville. All that stretch is incredible. And then I do love like the Port Rush, Port Stewart. Yeah. Uh, closer to my homes like Baltre, RD. Then you go up sort of Carton House, Royal Dublin, the island, Corliss, all that sort of stuff. Spoil. We're spoiled for choice. You're so spoiled, yeah, for, spoiled choice. for choice. Right, look at this shot. Yeah, it's not nice, is it? <laughs> Punch a wee 50, I think. Big kick. Dead oh, bounce, wasn't it? Nah, it's really well played. Just perfect line. You hugged yeah. that tree. It just didn't bounce. A little bit harder. Go ah. on. Great effort. Get in. Oh! <laughs> in she goes. Well done. Good putt. A birdie written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> What impresses you about a person? Mine would have to be generosity and kindness. You know, 
really pisses me off, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be driving across, I'd be driving in Ireland, and if I let someone across a, a pedestrian crossing and they don't wave, <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. I also get quite annoyed at that. But. Oh, just even just show a wee bit of yeah. appreciation. But yeah, definitely generosity and kindness. Because I, I feel that I get that for myself. Even talking to my mum, whether I bring home donuts for everyone. I wouldn't go into a shop and not bring something home for my brother when I was young. And I'd always have that kind of generosity trait. That's I think lovely. it's key to have. And if you could describe yourself, Brendan, in three words, what would they be? I'll say absolute trailblazer. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. How fun is it to be a trailblazer? I just love to do what I do. I feel um, I feel I can promote the game to the best of my, of my, of my ability. I feel I speak well about the game. Mm -hmm. And most of the work we do is kind, it's kind of 50 on course, 50 off course. When you win that event, you have two minutes of airtime to hit home with someone about your story or about trying to get more people into the game mm -hmm. and I say that to the guys on tour I said if you win a tournament embrace that three four minutes you have I said use that time wisely I said don't pump yourself up with loads of order I'm after winning this event I said talk about the course for a bit but promote the shit out of the game yeah because we need to get more people into it and the more people we get into this game the more our lives are going to be easier in the future of trying to build it mm. so that's what I say to them mm. Yeah, so the line's probably just right in the pin here. Par four? Yeah. Left is dead. Okay. Great shot. Absolutely Thanks. wonderful. It's a joy to watch that, Brendan. Thank you. Drop! That's, that's really good there, too. I thought of what you said. That was piped. Just try and, like, yeah. not think of the trees. <laughs> Do not think of the trees. <laughs> Did you always want to be a golfer? Not really. It was, I always loved the game, but profession-wise I never thought it was an avenue. Only until four or five years ago. I love business. I studied business in school. We have a family business, so I worked there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But then the golf took over, and then sponsorships started coming in. And I, I think every year I get a different sort of hunger for it. Because mm -hmm. it it's still new to me, all this. And I just, I love what I do. I love talking about the game and I love all that stuff, so mm -hmm. it's good. Mm, it's brilliant. I could, I could think of worse jobs now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> One, two, three. Slight help and wind. You don't want to go long here, so you need to hit the number. Okay. Strike. Oh, getting hole. Oh. Nearly slam dunked it. That's nice, I'll take that one. Great shot. Yeah. Ah, really good. Go. Go. Yeah, good roll. Had the line. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Go on. Oh. Brilliant effort, that's good. And of course, on any tour, whether it's the DP World Tour, PJ Tour, LPJ Tour, there are rivalries. Yeah. Are there rivalries out on the G4D Tour? Quite a few. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's hear about those. <laughs> uh, me and Kip haven't seen eye to eye a few times, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're a lot closer now. Right. I think the rivalry has definitely brought us closer together. But at the very start, when Kip came along, it's like we wanted to stand each other's heads. Yeah. I won in Dubai for the first time and it didn't go down well. And the has beaten me ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's uh, what competitive rivalry is all about, isn't uh, it? I know, like me and Kip do get on very well and, and you need that someone to push you. Yeah. And what I can say is he's raising the bar for disability golf. That's great. The, the scores he's shooting is on a different level. Mm -hmm. And it makes you work harder to get to his level. Because mm -hmm. you want to beat him. Mm -hmm. He's world number one at the minute, which he's extremely deserving to be world number one. Is he beatable? 100%. Great. Is he the most consistent player? 100%. <laughs> but him on a good day and me on a good day, I think there's very, very little between us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So with that in mind, what are you looking forward to this year? Share with us a little bit about what's, what you've got lined up and what we can get involved in and where we can support you. Yeah, so what's, um, what's incredible this year is we've, we're doing our first showcase on the PGA Tour at the CGA Cup by Nelson. 
I think the American market is huge. You know, the amount of veterans that are over there that are missing limbs, that have disabilities, that could get into the game, and also that are at a really, really high level, they can make a huge impact to what we do. Uh, we're trying to create this a, a mainstream sport, try and create a living from the game for a lot of these guys. And if we can get a tour of, say, 40, 50 players on the same level, mm. I think we're not far away from that. Mm. Big thing. And the G4D Open yeah. is coming back to yeah. Woburn. And we want as many people to come along as, and watch that as possible. Uh, how can they get involved and, and when is that? Yeah, so the G4D opens on the 15th to the 17th of May. Okay. It's an incredible opportunity to see some of the best players in the world doing abnormal things, like what you'll never see on your own normal golf course. People with extremely inspiring stories. Hitting that golf course, one of the hardest courses I think I've played in a long time. Yeah, you're telling me. Three lines, it's like playing in, a, in an ice rink. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, I get inspired every time I go to it because I don't get to experience many Edgar events anymore. Edgar events, there was so many diverse disabilities and it was like a big family. Where G4D is suddenly, you're thrown in with serious competitors that are only focused on beating each other. Mm. And it's really fun, it's really good for your game, but you do enjoy that sort of going back to see the old, old friends and yeah. having a few beers after, after the tournament ends. And I do miss that too. So this event is definitely a nice feeder for me to come back and meet all the guys again. And it's, it's, it's an incredible event. Yeah. This next question's a tough one because you spend your life on the golf course, but I'm wondering what's been your greatest memory on the golf course so far? Yeah, it would have to be, I've won a good few times, obviously they're fantastic memories. I, we've got so many people into the game, also fantastic memories, but I'm, I'm, like, I'm good fun, I'm good crack, I'm sort of a lad. <laughs> I remember hitting a two iron on 18, at I think it was the Australian, I don't know, the Australian club or something. Australian Open in 20, 19. I know I didn't hit it well but it went through the contours and landed about four feet from the pin and all the Irish in Australia were shouting lol <laughs> like going down the fairway going down the fairway and I was like this this feels like I've made it here I made wow. a moment and then I went and missed the putt <laughs> so, so it was a nightmare but, a <clears throat> but that's what I love about this that like I've made so many memories the last couple of years that I can tell my kids are grandkids. I have a wee nephew now. My brother's had a child. Amazing. His wife had a child there two years ago. And I have him in the simulator room hitting a few balls and put on YouTube and watch a video and he's like, then in golf? I was like, yeah. So it's great. Yeah. I'd love to see him just sort of even take inspiration for what I'm doing as well. And it creates awareness for, for every level, every age. And what do you hope that the, the next five years brings <coughs> for you, Brendan? Cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, basically, I want to turn. Yeah, obviously, we want to turn it into a mainstream sport. Get as many people into the game as possible. Uh, I want to see many more of these amazing athletes making a living from the game. I've been extremely lucky to make a living out of the game the last five years uh, and work with some fantastic brands, but. I think there's a lot of guys out there that deserve the same opportunities as I'm getting and as Kip is getting now as well because he's turned into a prolific winner. But if we can start introducing maybe small price ones into our events to keep the best interested in what we do because we don't want the best guys falling off because it feels they have nothing to play for. I think we need something to play for. That's important for these guys to stay and for more guys to push on to try and get their game to a level where, right, I can make a living from this game. So I think that's that's the key moment. Mm. Yeah. And how special is it for you to share this journey with your family? I know you've got your dad on the bag. That must feel you must feel really proud, and I know they're very proud of you. But you must feel proud to get to kind of share it all with them. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, Mum and dad travel a lot with me. Rebecca travels about twice, three times a year. It's unreal, and we're very lucky to be able to do it because not many people can have these amazing memories with their family. We're at every event together. We, me and dad get on very well, off the course. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we, we get on extremely well. Like I can't spend much time around many people, but me and him spend time together the whole time. and We never really get sick of each other. 
and then mom loves tagging along to to most events and she's my lucky charm for here because she wasn't going to come last year i said you have to come so she won and then she said to me last week i don't think i can go to woburn this year i have to mind tom I said, you're not minding tom i won this last year you're coming with me so um to share these experiences is incredible and i, and I have a lovely where i come from loud village the whole village is behind me as well anywhere i go i love going home there to meet my friends and you're walking through the village and someone would say well done in kenya last week brendan they're all following what you do mm. and it's a, it's a lovely village to come from mm. everyone's extremely supportive and with that in mind how important do you think the introduction of the g4d open has been as you mentioned it's a wider field a broader yeah. field they've got the elite category but it's, it's very inclusive yeah. how important and significant has that event been to encouraging so many people to take up golf yeah it's incredible and, and what's so important about that week whether you're playing gross net or staple for category everyone's on the same level yeah every every category matters that week mm. every player matters and the coverage as well the coverage sky put on this event is is truly incredible to do a one and a half hour show that's run along a certain amount of weeks and if anyone's in sick and hospital watching that or just had an accident mm -hmm. if that doesn't inspire you to take up the game i don't know what will mm. so i think it's incredible Golf's a very intimidating game for everybody, let alone if you have a disability. If you had one message to anyone watching this that perhaps is thinking that they can't play golf yeah. because they, they, they have a disability of some kind, mm. I'm wondering what that message would be. There's going to be worse players out there than you. I think that's, I had the fear off 28 when I started. There's people off 36, 46, 56 now. Yeah. And I think you should never be embarrassed of what level your game's at because there's going to be people on the same level, worse, better. It's just life. And you can aspire to get better at golf. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it as well. You put a wee bit of work and a wee bit of practice in, it's one game you will definitely see results in, which is great. Mm. Yeah. Shot. Well, that's all over. What a shot. Get in the hole. Stay up. Stay up. Oh. Great roll. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Brendan. Go on. Oh. Great effort, mate. That's good as well. Two nice pars to finish off. Anyway, thanks so much. It's been an absolute treat, really, really to have your company. That. Thank Thanks you so much. So, so much. Yeah, no, really love that. Thank um, you. We wish you all the best this thanks year. So we'll you. be watching. 100%. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go inside.